Hey guys, one clue here. I hope all of you are doing well and having a really great day. Today, I want to announce a new series called BitX 101, where we do take a look on all those topics around the BitX project. So in today's video, we want to take a look on the history of the BitX project and how everything started. So let's get started. Hello, hello, hello. I'm One Clue, and you are joining in here to the first session of BitX 101. Today, we do have a special guest. We have the instigator of the BitX project here with us, Scott. Thanks for being here. Hey, hey, thanks for and, having me. This is cool. And before we start with anything else, I want to quickly introduce myself, and then we can quickly go over and uh, introduce you to the audience. So I'm one clue and I studied business computer science and uh, I just got out of, out of nowhere. I got into the BitX project and uh, found out about it. And uh, yeah, what I love to do is to do videos about BitX, BitX about uh, videos about crypto in general and just educating people. These days I also do a couple of workshops for the people to educate them on how to build their own BitX devices because you need a little bit of proof of work in order to get started doing this with an ASIC. But let's hop over to you, Scott, and let's let's see how how are uh, who are you? How are you? What's going on? Well, uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm excited to be on this show with you. Thank you for for starting the idea of the show and having me on. Um, so uh, let's see about me. I'm Scott. Uh, I I'm an electrical engineer by training. I studied embedded systems and um, in school and I had been doing that professionally for probably about uh, 15 years uh, before this for designing kind of all, all kinds of stuff for, for different clients, had a pretty wide exposure to a lot of different projects uh, working on, on client work and designing embedded systems for them. So, um, you know, while in addition to being uh, like I guess formally trained in this. I actually also really enjoy it, um, which is nice. It's been fun to work on things that I enjoy uh, constantly for my professional career. Uh, but uh, I guess you all are interested in the Bit Axe. So, um, yeah, I'm the, I'm the instigator of the Bit Axe project. I kind of like that word, the instigator. It's kind of like someone who like starts trouble. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I kind of just started the project and it, it's, it's, um, it's grown to be a lot more than just me. I think that's pretty important. Um, and it's, so it's like a, how did it actually start? Like you, you're the instigator. So how did this project came up to you? Okay. So, um, let's see, I, I kind of two, two separate things. Like while I was in school, I learned about Bitcoin, um, from a dude like actually at a party. It was like a house party. And this guy was telling me he was buying drugs on the Silk Road. And I, I was like, wow, this is crazy. And he like, he was really into it. And in fact, at this party, he like got out of his laptop and we like logged into the Silk Road. And he was showing me all these crazy things. And I was, I was kind of amazed because the interface for Silk Road, at least at that time, it looked kind of like Amazon. Like they had adopted the same like layout as Amazon at the time. So it was like, this weird like dark net uh, Amazon for drugs. Uh, anyways, you know, we were looking at these things and I'm looking at these prices and it was, it definitely wasn't dollars and it had this B symbol and I was like, what's that? He's like, oh, it's Bitcoin. And, you know, he was going and buying the Bitcoin like in person. At, I think it was local Bitcoins or some precursor to that. It was like he was going to like cafes and stuff and just like trading dollars for Bitcoin so that he could then uh, put it on the Silk Road and, um, and buy drugs with it. But I remember asking, you know, like, okay, cool. So like how much is a Bitcoin worth? And I'm pretty sure he told me it was $20. So I was like, okay, cool. Interesting. And I forgot about it for a little while after that. And then, um, I was, uh, I graduated and, and I was working actually at the university where I went after I graduated and I was in a lab and we had a, like a ton of FPGAs. 
and I had been, you know, reading about uh, Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. Um, and there was like a ton, a ton of FPGAs in this lab. Like, you know, it was a lab for the students and they had like an FPGA workstation kind of at each desk with a pretty fancy FPGA um, there for each one. And then, you know, but the, it was only in use for like an hour, a couple mm. hours a day. And like, so there was plenty of room to do other stuff. There's plenty of room to do that. And there's actually like a storeroom full of like extra FPGAs that were like, oh my goodness, there. So heaven. Yeah. So I I grabbed, I grabbed some of those and I I went online and and grabbed an open source uh, FPGA bitstream for mining Bitcoin. Loaded it up. I'm like, this is fantastic. And I was like, mining Bitcoin. And I was actually talking with my boss about it. And, you know, he was like, well, that's pretty cool. Like, I don't see any reason why we can't do this. Like, let's load them all up and let's run them. And uh, he was pretty excited because he's like, you know, we hadn't heard about the Bitcoin pizza at this time, but we like just almost immediately came to this conclusion that we're, we're going to mine enough Bitcoin to buy a pizza for, for our office. So we were mining and I was having a lot of fun experimenting with Bitcoin mining. And it was it was very cool because the... Bitstream for the FPGA, that's the, the file that configures the FPGA and, and makes it do what it what it's going to do, um, was open source as well as the, the full, like, um, I think it was uh, Verilog uh, design for it. And so I got to, like, tinker around with it and, like, see how it works and was definitely impressed by the sort of decentralization of it um, that, like... You know, I could just I could just do this, and there wasn't like a main server in charge. That's like it's kind of a kind of that concept blew my mind when I finally like wrapped my head around it. That like there's no one in charge of this. It's like it's, it's the network. Anyways, if you're into Bitcoin, you've heard that story before. Um, but uh, yeah, we were mining to this pool called 50 BTC that got hacked and mm-hmm. lost all this Bitcoin. It wasn't really that. I mean. I'm sure that would have been great to have now, but at the time it wasn't very much, and so it was no big deal. Uh, forgot about it for um, probably a couple more years, and um, and then I was, you know, working uh, for a client that was doing some um, solar-powered gateways. They're actually LoRa mm-hmm. gateways that were out in the middle of nowhere in like Africa and collecting data, and they were solar-powered. And for some reason, I was just thinking about Bitcoin again and was thinking about Bitcoin mining. And I had been following the sort of advent of Bitcoin mining ASICs, but like never really felt like buying any or, or jumping into it, unfortunately. So I didn't, I didn't really do that. But then um, I was thinking it'd be really cool to make a solar powered Bitcoin miner. Um, and the, the more I read about it, the more I was convinced that this is a perfect pairing because um the the chips themselves the bitcoin mining asics are fundamentally low voltage dc devices just like solar cells um and it just seemed like a perfect match so i kind of did after i had this idea i you know did what i did before which is just kind of start googling it and like be like okay cool like i'll just get a reference design and i'll you know hook up a solar panel to one of these miners and just change it to uh, work directly off DC, that'll be easy, right? But it was right. It was it was a different like with the advent of ASICs, Bitcoin mining had moved away from open source. It was there was nothing. It was you know everything was um, closed source, proprietary. There was no like hardware schematics. There was no like real indication of how these ASICs worked. Um, there was an open source firmware for the S9 from Brains. Uh, and that was basically it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I um, I started looking at pictures of the Antminer, I think U1 or U2. It was a USB stick that had a mm-hmm. single uh, BM1380 chip on it, ASIC on it. Uh, that's the chip out of the S1, 2, and 3, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started, I, I was like too cheap to buy one at this point. I was just looking at pictures of them on the internet. I was like trying to reverse engineer it from pictures on the internet. I'm like, I, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need to reverse engineer this, um, figure out how this is going to work. 
And so I started doing that and digging into it and um, doing my best to like copy it from a couple pictures on the internet, which got surprisingly far. I, I can't tell you why I didn't just buy one. They weren't that expensive, but I was clearly like, you know, this is just a goofy project. I'm not going to like invest in it. Um, and got printed in that. And then I was like, okay, this is, this is going to work. I should buy something. And so I bought a couple, uh, hash boards out of the S2, which were pretty cheap by this point and was like, all right, I'm just going to harvest the chips off these and I'm going to do my own miner using the VM 1380. Um, and it wasn't called Bitax or anything then. This was just, it didn't have a name. I was just futzing around, um, you know, in my spare time. And it, I kind of, I think I lost interest. All right. You know, got, I got sidetracked and started working on something else for a while, for a while. That, that was when that, that was, um, I think by this time that was 2017 when I was All getting right. those, those hash boards. So we, I think I also got an S9 and was playing around with that think maybe s9s were still too expensive then anyways i just wrote a bunch of stuff down and you know read about it a bunch and then kind of dropped it for for a couple more years um until i think like late 2020 or mm -hmm. uh yeah i think it was probably late 2020 that i was i was uh yeah that's that's when i got the s9 i got the s9 and started tearing it down. I was like, oh my gosh, I got to do this. And, you know, I was Googling around and there was um, a couple, uh, well, there was, there was one group, Gecko Science, that was taking these chips and making their own USB miners. So this was at least my first exposure to someone who had reverse engineered this and was making their own hardware with Bitmain's chips. So like, you know, totally unauthorized. And uh, Gecko Science mostly seems to communicate via uh, the Bitcoin Talk forum, and so there's a lot of interesting stuff to read on there about it. But one thing, as a as a you know electronics design engineer such as myself, I was like, well, that's great, but it's not open source. Like, there's no schematics for it. Like, I got one, but you know, I really wanted to like play with this and hook it up to. Uh, um, a solar panel and you know work on it sort of and change it and make it my own and yeah science that's just not their model they're not open source um mm. and actually pretty tight-lipped about uh a lot of stuff that they do and that was pretty frustrating for me because it's like i want to talk about this like technically how this works i want to know more i want to dig into this and um you know gecko science's model uh which has been pretty successful for them is just you know um they have a sole designer and uh, he builds them and he has, he manufactures them and he has a couple sellers that, that sell them. And that, that's the model. And so that's a similar model to the way that the big industrial miners work. So there's um, like no, no difference. It's just like in a smaller size form factor, the same thing is the proprietary hardware. Yeah, I, I think this, yeah, this which, all, yeah, I was gonna say it's, you know, I like that. I think that's a really good idea is to have a smaller miner that's more practical to run at home. And I would definitely notice that, that a lot of people are passionate about those Gecko Science USB stick miners. Like there's people would post pictures of, you know, they have like a dozen of these things plugged into this crazy custom made USB hub mm. and, you know, they're loving it. And um, after having ran an S9 briefly in my office, uh, where we had free electricity, it was like, well, it's great. We got free electricity. This is pretty profitable, but I can't stand to have this thing on. Yeah, It's, it's too loud. loud. It's too hot. So I liked the uh, that small home miner aspect. And I, I kind of saw the Gecko Science design was like, there's some things I want to change about this. Like there's some things that I could bring to the table um, to add on to this and, and make it even more practical. Um, so, more easier for people to run, for me to run, for me to run them all over the place. And then there's also the solar idea. All right. So you got like basically the idea of, okay, what I currently do see is nice, but it is not really that what you wanted, right? So what, what was the inspiration that you had to actually do the, the BitX project? And what kind of problem do you think 
do you solve with it? So, um, the, I, I sent you that, that sort of timeline of all the different designs. It was originally called the day miner cause it was going to be like a, a miner that connected to a solar panel and didn't have a yeah, battery. Let, me, just let like... me quickly bring up the picture. I do have it with me. Okay. Oh, nice. There we go. So this is a slide from that. I gave a talk at the, um, Indianapolis Bitcoin meetup, uh, last fall but on the left there is the day miner r1 so that's and then that date is when i when i ordered the pcb so i had been futzing with it for a while to get to that point but um yeah it's called the day miner because it's gonna mine bitcoin during the day right it's, it was, yeah i don't right. know like i wasn't really thinking too much about the name because i was just going to uh try and get it to work that uh that first one that's highlighted there uh the day miner r1 um I didn't get the footprint right. And so it didn't work. It, it kind of mm. worked. It actually, it would spit back some bytes, but they were, they were nonsense and it wasn't working consistently. And it wasn't until like, I actually used that bad footprint on the day miner X three. That was me trying to hook up three uh, chips. These are the, the thirteen ninety or 87 out of the S nine chips that are on mm. all these ones. Mm -hmm. um, so those first th uh, two didn't really work at all. Uh, cause I didn't have the footprint, right? So that's the footprint for the chip. And you know, like a normal part that you might buy from DigiKey, there's a data sheet that says the exact footprint that you need to use. We don't have that. So I was actually like taking these chips and, um, look at, and looking at them under a microscope, holding them really close to calipers. I even put it in my scanner and tried to scan it to like figure out what exactly the, uh, the pin pitch is for the that's footprint. ridiculous <laughs> <But laughs> yeah it's just, it is reverse engineering right yeah that's i mean that's what you got to do there isn't really any other option like i don't know if people with fancier shops may have a, a better microscope that can actually like measure things under it but i didn't have that so but by that third one the one that's may uh of 2022 um i had i had realized my error i had got the footprint right and um that one worked. So that's two chips from the S9. And I also, at the, <laughs> I came up with the, the Bitax name for that one. That was the first one that's called the Bitax, the Bitax V1. Um, and just real quickly, the idea with Bitax was it's like a pickaxe, you know, that you might use in a, a mine, like a, you know, in the dirt kind of mine. So it's like a pickaxe for Bitcoin, a Bitax. So that, that was the name. It's kind of cool. I do like, you know, it. it's like, these are all afterthoughts of like, oh, I got to order this board. I need to put something on there that's called and just sort of put it on there. And, uh, I kind of like, I thought the bit axe was slick. So anyways, we put that on there. Um, and that one was kind of the first one that I, um, that I posted on Bitcoin talk and on Twitter. And I like, you know, like five followers on Twitter. And so no one responded to me about it on Twitter and, a couple people, maybe like one or two people on Bitcoin talk responded to me about it, but nothing much. And Bitcoin talk has this weird sort of, I don't know, it's just ethos of like scammers, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people I think thought that I was, that this was vaporware or that I was trying to scam people. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I got a lot of comments of like, Oh, a lot of people have tried this before and no one's done it, you know? And, or like, oh, it looks like you're just trying to do what uh, Sidehack, the guy who runs Gecko Science, is doing. And so it, I didn't get a lot of a lot of response, but I did get a couple people and started communicating back and forth with a couple people about that first one, the Bitx V1. And um, you know, all along, my concept was for the for the Bitx was I'm gonna. I'm going to put this underneath the solar panel. And so it needs to have the control board running the miner software on it. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> I think all the small, um, Gecko science boards and other pod miners and stuff, they always ran CG miner on a computer and connected via USB to that computer. And so you had to have a computer to, to send the work to the ASICs. And so from the beginning, I was like, that's not the model I'm going for. These things need to be completely sort of self-sufficient like that you could if you can get power and wi-fi to it you can just put it outside underneath the solar panel in fact the, the first idea 
um, was that I was, wasn't even going to use Wi-Fi. I was going to use like a sub gigahertz mesh network protocol to do it because there, there'd be one underneath each solar panel and they'd be all out in the field. And so those, those first two bit axes, the bit V1 and the V2, didn't have any um, control board on them because um, that, that was going to be a separate like TI, um, CC1492, so anyway, something, a sub gigahertz mesh protocol radio on there. Um, let's see. So that, um, you know, one of the, I, let's see, what was I say? The, um, I was talking about sort of the, the, you know, the, one of the reasons why I just decided I had to do this myself is because no one else was doing it open source. And it was like, you know, I've always used a lot of open source software, um, in my, uh, the computer science portion of my like university experience was very heavily open source oriented. Um, and I had been involved in hardware projects and there's a lot of just like Arduino kind of open source, you know, like actually specifically Arduino, just open source, um, initiatives that had, had gotten a lot of steam and like a lot of cool things were being built on it. And so it just seemed like a no brainer to me to like do this open source, like Bitcoin is open source, you know, like I'm going to build something closed source on top of like this brilliant open source monetary network. So, um, you know, I was kind of pushing this open source thing on Bitcoin talk, but it wasn't, it just wasn't resonating. Like no one was really digging that part of it. Not really anyone, no one was really digging it at all, to be honest. Um, and so, um, this random guy reached out to me. He's like, this is really cool. I saw your project. Like, you know, I, uh, he's a big, he's a, um, a Bitcoin miner repairman. Like this is professions. He works on these, but he was also like very interested in the open source side of things and like learning more about how to do it. And so, um, he started, um, this is sort of apes a lot. He started, uh, he named it, he named, he, he founded the, uh, open source miners United, the OSMU. Um, and he started a discord and, um, I guess I should back up just one quick second. There, there was an, there was another guy who started his own discord first gizmo miner, um, and invited me to it. And I was like, Oh, like discord, like I'd never even been on discord before. And I was sort of hesitant, but I was on his discord and we had uh, a couple people there and we were having some interesting chats and then gizmo miner uh, actually had some health issues and disappeared and so that's when surveys a lot kind of took it over and started open source miners united um which um you know pretty quickly grew to like you know 1500 members and a bustling ecosystem and attracting all sorts of cool folks such as yourself um to it um the question was what inspired you to do the bid axe i think yeah, it, it we, was we just were... like i just wanted to do this but what inspired me to like do the bid axe the way it's being done now is the open source miners united community this is like somehow we've attracted all these people that are super interested in open source bitcoin mining and are super into it and like that's what inspires me to keep doing it and you know I think the cool thing is that through OSMU, um, we've met several core contributors who are incredibly talented and like just, you know, nailed some of the parts that I was definitely struggling with, like the uh, firmware for the right, because we need, because the whole goal all along was we're going to have a, a microcontroller on there that's the control board that's running the minor firmware. And so, I was plodding along at it, but I, um, you know, it wasn't until, uh, another member, Johnny nine showed up and was like, I'm really good at this and just like made it happen. He, uh, I, um, I, I gave him, I, I, I made five bit axes. This was like the bit axe max, like V one, I hand built them here and I gave them, I, I, I mailed out all five and these, these were two like OG um, forum members and, but there was no 
firmware at this point. Like it just did not work on its own. It was like just the hardware. Um, and uh, Nebula Miner was one of them. Nebula Miner was an early uh, enthusiast who came through actually Bitcoin Talk and followed us to the to the Discord forums. Um, and uh, actually, Bitmaker was was one of the original people, um, the uh, the creator of the Nerd Miner. Um, so talented people showed up and were able to like take on these things, and it was just like now now this is like a group project, and this is exciting, and like. I'm like going, you know, having back and forth with people about technical things and like how we're going to make this better. And like people are coming to me like, oh, this can this can work like this. And then um, uh, Ben, Ben shows up and uh, he's uh, a talented front end developer and made the whole like he's like, oh, I'm just going to do this and just made the the beautiful dashboard uh, XOS that we have for the BitX, um, which it was fantastic. I have no idea how to do that. Um, knocked it out of the park. He also was like, oh, you know, I'm, <laughs> I just learned how to solder. So I'm going to start, I'm going to get myself a pick and place machine and start manufacturing these bit axes in bulk, which he also did. Oh, and he also made a public pool, which is a great open source pool because man, there's so many facets to this, but you know, you can't have Realistically, you can't have Bitcoin mining without a Stratum server uh, at the bare yeah, minimum. Obviously. Like something to provide work to the Bitcoin miner. And so there's there was some incumbent services out there. Uh, CK Pool was kind of what everyone was using their Gecko Science sticks with, um, which worked fine. But it wasn't it wasn't dialed in for mining with. Um, with the bit axe it, it kind of has some some weird things about the difficulty they the difficulty is kind of set permanently high it, and um the source for that for uh, ck pool is open source um which is great we definitely learned a lot from that really appreciate that forever grateful for that being open source um but you know when ben put together a public pool it was sort of done in conjunction with the BitX development, which just really um, helped make the the Stratum client in the BitX more robust and gave us a platform for testing and also a platform for um, sort of BitAxers to to connect their BitAxes to. And we could like see in aggregate, like how they're all working and seeing them all coming online as they're being built. Um, so now that we do have like this broader community of multiple talented people that are coming into this one community called OSMU, what, what is actually like the vision or the, the long-term goal that you do have for the BitX project? Well, so this is, you know, it's, it's almost taken me by surprise. The success of the BitX has been like mind-blowing, super quick, um, have, we haven't been at this in earnest for very long at all. And there's thousands of things out there. We have, we have tons of members, tons of contributors. Um, and I, um, Johnny actually convinced me to apply for a grant, uh, last fall, uh, from open sats. I did and found out early this year that I got it. And I, I had been, sort of daydreaming like, man, you know what, maybe I need to quit my day job and like focus on this if I only had a little bit of like seed funding to help that decision. So I got the grant. Um, it actually just worked out perfectly with um, my day job, which actually I'm a co-owner of. So it was, it was just more of a discussion with my co-founder. But um, for me to, to step away from that and start working on this full time. So I have essentially quit my day job to uh, work on my part-time gig and um, gonna gonna make the uh, uh, the next sort of generation of the bit axis. So my my vision and long-term goal for the bit axis is to produce a roughly one terahash um, home miner that. Uh, is plug and play simple like the BitX is now, um, and 
to sell uh, one million of them. And so that'll be uh, that'll be an exahash, right? So a million one terahash units is an exahash, um, and that that's actually not even a long term goal. That's a, that's a near term goal. Um, I you know a million seems like a lot. That's a lot of units. Um, I've never produced a million of anything before. Um, I've done like tens of thousands in my day job. So you know it's it's a big task. But um, with the the grant funding from OpenSats and um, the incredible support of the OSMU community, um, I think we can do this. I think we can get a very affordable one terahash home miner that's like plug and play simple, get an exahash out there. And the cool thing about having an exahash out there is that currently, as of today, that is, um, actually, let me, uh, let me go to solochance.com. If you guys haven't seen that website, it's pretty slick. But we can uh, we can see with the current difficulty. If you have an exahash mining, then uh, that's solving a block on average every five days. Um, so that would be, you know, there's a million bit axes out there, but one bit axer would get the block. And if they're solo mining, they would get the full block reward um, every five days. And, you know, as we're approaching that, we start finding blocks more and more. Like, to be clear, I don't think a bit access, a solo mining bit access solved the block yet. But we are getting, it's bound to happen any day now, especially as more and more of them get out there. But this is going to start selling itself, right? Once people are like, I got it. I solved the block. I just got you know, 6.25 or 3.125 next month, um, Bitcoin. And um, then it's going to be like, okay, maybe, maybe, you know, buying one of these BitX miners is a good idea, right? And and solo mining is, is, is going to work, right? Because that's the cool thing is you can, you can get this, you know, maybe it has a somewhat high initial cost. Um, but it doesn't really cost anything to run it. You can basically forget about it if you want. You can plug it in, I got a couple back there, right? Like when can you conduct an interview with miners, with Bitcoin miners running behind you? You can do it with BitAx because they're quiet. They're cool. They're not gonna annoy everyone you live with. Um, so yeah, you can buy one, you can plug it in back there, you can forget about it. Uh, or you can get involved, you can learn how Bitcoin mining works, you can develop firmware for it, you could totally geek out on it whichever way you want. But I think selling a million of them is is a, a lofty goal, but I think it's reasonable. I think it's doable. And that would have just an awesome effect for Bitcoin, you know, to decentralize mining. Like an extra hash is no joke. I realize we're at like almost 600 of them in the 600 extra hash or whatever in the network hash rate right now. So it wouldn't it would be a small piece, but, you know, a sizable piece. And then um, the network effects just make that number grow faster and faster. And then, you know, maybe maybe different models, different hash rates for people who are getting more and more into it to satiate their need. Um, but that's that's the, the current vision and the, the near-term goal. But the long-term goal is to just extend that even further because I am fully convinced that Bitcoin needs uh, open source mining. Uh, Bitcoin is open source. It needs open source mining. And the um, Bitcoin mining needs to be decentralized. We have this big problem happening right now where there's only a couple uh, mining pools and it's in the hands of these big organizations that they might not be so resistant to government censorship um, or uh, regulation. And, you know, they, they also, it's just... Bitcoin doesn't work as well if there's a few entities that can just make decisions that have a significant effect over the Bitcoin network. So I think it needs yeah. to be decentralized. I think home miners can do it. I was having an interesting conversation the other day with someone. They were talking about, you know, it's going to take it's going to take 10 megawatts to get. Um, no. Anyway, they're talking about the just insane amount of uh, electrical power it's going to take to get on the next um, exahash of Bitcoin mining. Right. And I was like, what if I told you we could bring that online with no infrastructure costs whatsoever, no transformers, no power purchase agreements, no like insane warehouses 
full of miners. We'll just do it in the houses. You know, everyone's just got one running back there, right? And we get an exa hash online, like, and then the next exa hash, and then maybe 10, right? Like with no infrastructure costs and like no authorities are really going to know that you're running it, right? Whether it's legal or not in your jurisdiction, they're not going to know that you're running it because, you know, it's like, I think you can see behind me, but I've got like my, my Wi-Fi access point and then I've got my Bitcoin miner. Like those both use the same amount of power. So like, How good luck telling from a power company's point of view, which one's which. Yeah, the only thing they could probably do is by actually analyzing the traffic. But nevertheless, it, it, it appears to be like that the, the BitX project itself is something that will grow. And especially with the amount of growth that we have seen here in this community, there will probably be a big, big amount of more interest be coming in as soon as like one of those ones hits the block, I believe. But speaking about this, um, you explain to us quickly that all of these other projects like Gecko Science or other projects that evolved before that, they are never like, they never have been open source. And now you told to us that BitX is open source. But despite this fact, what else differentiates like BitX from other projects? And what are the technical capabilities of it? Or And, and for example, what is the user experience, especially for it? You talked about that there is a UI and stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. The, the, the big differentiator in my mind is the open source part, but there, there are some other differentiators and we're not just trying to like do some open source clone of other projects that are out there. Definitely not. Um, so, you know, some of the defining features of, of the bid acts, um, is that like I was talking about, it has that it has it's Wi-Fi powered, right? Like a lot of, um, Bitcoin miners are powered by Ethernet, or mm -hmm. um, you have to use a separate computer to uh, to control it, and so then you you connect that computer via whatever method. But the idea that it's self-contained, we've um, the OSMU team, the BitX development team, and the core contributors, we've um, we've recreated the mining software in. Um, in the firmware that's running on the ESP32, like right on the back of it. Um, I don't know, I'm not over there. But, you know, it's it's like, it's self-contained. So you just plug it in and uh, configure the Wi-Fi and it connects to your network and it mines to whatever pool you want, whether it's a self-hosted um, solo mining node or it's a big pool somewhere else. So that that's kind of a pretty cool uh, differentiating aspect is, is fully contained, right? It runs on firmware on Wi-Fi, Um, and then it's, um, you know, there's, there's another cool project out there that, um, uh, the future bit Apollo. So that, that's been around for, uh, several years now. Um, I know John, the guy who works on it, smart guy has put out a bunch of different, uh, mining hardware projects. Um, they um they're bigger units so they uh also have a node in them and um which is cool it's a good idea you can host your own node and you can mine right to it but they're they're bigger units they're like and they're you know, over a thousand dollars um mm. and and generally less portable um a little bit more commitment to get one of these and get it going so i think that the bit axe being uh smaller cheaper and um more sort of uh, kind of easier to to um, distribute and and decentralize um, and show to your friends at the pub. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, some of the amazing OSM you guys uh, like Duncan. You know, he he ran his bid act on the plane. Uh, it was so rad. Like, you know, he he powered it via uh, the little plug under your seat and got the like $10 plane Wi-Fi and just was mining on the plane. It was like, that's mining powered by jet fuel. <laughs> so cool. Um, so yeah, they're really yeah. portable. You can, you can get them into a lot of different locations. I think that that differentiates it from a lot of the other miners out there is that, um, 
the gecko science stuff which is definitely cool is requires a computer to use it and so the, that's uh, definitely like a, a drawback when it comes to like the user experience point of view i i'd say like if i need to have an extra computer in order to plug in my monitor it's like an, it's a bummer to get started instead of just plugging it in configuring the wi-fi and there you go yeah yeah that's that's exactly what it was in my mind like i said you know my intent was to run these underneath solar panels and so i'm not gonna like have a computer underneath each solar panel all right Full, but not a pc right all right, so you, you spoke about that this was like your, your initial uh, thought process about it to run it on solar. Let's let's dive a little bit maybe into this section. What are those challenges that you encountered like while developing the BitX project, the PCB, re, um, rethinking how these thingies are working out on the PCB? Well, initially, the, the biggest problem is that the, the ASIC that we use is manufactured by Bitmain, um, and there's no documentation for it at all. Um, okay, I guess I take that back. There's a little bit. There's these repair guides. Um, mm -hmm. Bitmain doesn't really do them anymore, but they used to publish these repair guides, which are, I think they're like leaked. I think it's for people who take their course to repair bit, their miners, and it's, they're, they're uh, they're pretty poorly translated from Chinese and uh, they're they're kind of vague, but that was all we had was was those repair guides and then there was a little bit of help from um, what uh, Kano had done in CG Miner for the Gecko Science sticks because I mentioned that um, Gecko Science was the, sort of the first that I'm aware of that reverse engineered the hardware um, and and. They the Gecko Science sticks use CG Miner, so that and CG Miner is open source, so we could see in that firmware um, how they were controlling the chips. But the the CG Miner code and the um, the um, um, I'm blanking on it. The uh, oh, the repair guide. Sorry. Uh, the repair guides, you know, it was a little glimpse into how these work, but it was it was a big challenge to figure out exactly how these chips work because we need to communicate with them. We need to electrically interface with them. You know, there's a whole host of other circuitry that needs to be on board to operate the chip itself. So figuring out what that needed to be. Um, and you, you saw from that picture that you posted, it took me three revisions to get the footprint right just kind of trial and error on the footprint. All the interfacing for the ASIC itself was was a challenge. Um, it was fun. Uh, it was definitely fun to do. It was fun to reverse engineer that stuff. And it like, you know, I would talk with all sorts of uh, minor repair guys, you know, get little tips from them, like little things that they've picked up, um, little tips from, um, you know, we've got a lot of uh, friends that sort of came out of the woodwork who work on uh, third-party firmware for ant miners? They're like, oh yeah, you know, like they just toss little little tips over, and then of course getting them the ant miners, uh, and then you know hooking up a logic analyzer to it, and and trying to back out as much as we can from the way that the ant miners work. Um, this sounds tough, to be honest. I mean, it's tough. It was a lot of work. It was a lot, a lot of work. I don't even know how much it would cost if you had like pay someone hourly to do that. Because there's, you know, there's myself working on a, a lot and uh, a bunch of other guys. Uh, you know, Nebula is legendary uh, at this. Nebula Miner, and uh, you know Ben and Johnny and there's there's several other uh, guys who are working on this. Um, but yeah, that was tough. That was really, really tough. Um, there's a couple other things that were a little bit tricky. They're more classic electrical engineering problems, I guess. Like the chips are fundamentally like one, uh, 1.5 to 1.2 volts um, at relatively high current, which is a little bit tricky from a power supply uh, standpoint. Uh, dealing with that, I think actually the uh, the 1387 out of the the uh, S9, I think it's like a half volt. Um, that was a, a really insane. low voltage chip. So, 
And I think the S the J Pro, the thirteen sixty two is also a really low voltage chip like that, like 0.62 volts, something like that. So trying to de design a voltage regulator to take something like five volts input and drop it down to, um, you know, 1.5 volts, for example, and have it do that at uh, 10 amps is non-trivial. But luckily, there's lots of documentation for how that works. So we've got that figured out. Um, that's, that's awesome. So while we, while we spoke about those challenges that you faced with it, let's go to the other end and let's talk about what are some of those achievements that you have actually achieved or milestones that you have broken with, with the bidex or what else is, is coming there that you think is, is needed to be introduced here? Oh man, achievements. There's been so many, there's been so many lately. Like it is just madness. Like, uh, it started with the 1387, the BM 1387 chip out of the S9. And then I think I was talking with like, um, um, I think it was probably Nebula back then. And it was like, you know what? Let's do the 1397 out of the S17 chip. Like, let's just give it a try. And uh, got it working like really quickly. And then it seems like not that long after that, the... Um, I was talking with, I think it was Ben, and it was like, should we do the the 1366 out of the S19 XP? And I was like, all right, let's just do it. And Johnny just like, just nailed the firmware. It was just like, oh yeah, cool, I got it working. You know, I, I built him some hardware that kind of like had a little bit, a couple extra wires on it where I screwed up and stuff and like sent it to him. He's like, yeah, I got the, got the firmware working. It's totally mining now. And it was like, all right. So that was the birth of the Bidax Ultra which was the 1366 chip by the XP. And then, um, you know, the, the sort of maturing of the firmware, right? It was really rough in the beginning. Um, but then Ben showed up and made that dashboard, which just makes it super easy to get it uh, on your Wi-Fi network. Um, and the, the host mode, the host AP, where it's like, if you first turn it on, it creates its own wireless access point that then you join, and then it pops up a captive portal so that you can just configure right there like that whole process is actually uh non-trivial like i've been involved in a bunch of iot projects that have struggled with that um getting that provisioning of devices on your network working and so people might not realize it but that's that's kind of hard you know if you've ever used an iot device and you like struggle to get it on your network i think you know what i mean like it, it don't always work very well and so I think we've got it working really well. So a lot of that is thanks to, to Ben, who just figured all that out. Um, Self-proclaimed not embedded system developer, but seems to do pretty well. Uh, let's see. Um, and then we, um, you know, the hex development has been underway for a long time. It originally was going to use the 1397 chips out of the S17, and then it was kind of, slowly coming along and it got switched uh uh a developer smart guy named mcfighter showed up and was like i want to work on this thing and i was like yes all right here you go here's what i have so far given my like chicken scratch notes and he just started running with it and so it's working now i've got one on my desk it mines it's nearly two tera hash or sorry three tera hash um it's got six chips 1366s out of the xp and that's it's a huge it's a huge huge achievement um, because of the way those chips are connected um, in series and the way that the the data sort of snakes through all six of those chips. Um, go look at the schematic if you don't believe me, but it's uh, it's pretty neat. And you know, doing that without any documentation about how these chips work is cool. A lot of trial and error, a lot of like looking closely and thinking about it, and late nights being like. It's not working. It's not working. Oh, what about this? Let's try that. So, by the way, that's that's the fun part. Um, so that's a huge achievement. Um, and then sort of, I mean, this isn't a, a bit axe achievement, but I think that the, um, the Pi axe and the Q axe and the Flex axe, which are all OSMU projects that have sort of spun out of this by a very uh, talented guy who's just showed up out of nowhere, I guess. Um, 
And I, I think that's a huge achievement to have other people that are running with this and improving on it and like kind of blowing my mind and being like, all right, here, I just made this. And it's like, this is cool. This and is that's, that's super cool. Like actually this brings us also to like the next point of view that I'll, the next point that I want to dis discuss with you, like how yeah. does actually the BitX project engage with the community? How could people or enthusiasts contribute to it? Or as you said, you introduced quickly the PyX and the QX uh, as like projects that were born out of this OSMU community. Well, yeah. So we kind of, like I mentioned before, we the this project sort of floundered a little bit in the beginning because there was no community around it. It was basically just me and a couple people I was, I think, emailing with, but we weren't like sharing it with anyone else. There was no, it wasn't very easy to like get involved at that point um, until really until uh, the Open Source Miners United Discord got started by... Um, by uh vips sir vapes a lot um and that was like a public forum that is a public forum that anyone can join um and if you're listening to this and you want to join go to uh osmu.bitax.org and you that's an invite link and you'll be there um but th that's that's the premier way to uh engage with the community uh, you can you can follow me on twitter you can go to bitax.org and uh get on github and look at all the stuff on there that's that's a good way to get involved too but by far the best way is via this discord chat room there's a ton of people there's a lot of different channels with a lot of different topics um and a lot of really smart people that are just dropping like these amazing uh skills left and right on on different stuff but there's also a really cool ethos of like you know, people show up and they have trouble with their soldering or they just don't get the, how this works at all and they want to be involved. And so, like, don't feel overwhelmed that you have to be, like, a badass engineer or something to do this because you don't. And I am continually impressed by how sort of um, just selfless some of the people in the OSMU uh, chat are in, in helping people that are brand new to this. Um as an example, I think when Ben, one of our main core contributors showed up, he didn't really know anything about soldering. Um, and we kind of helped him get his first, I mean, he did most of it himself, but we helped him get his first couple bit acts soldered together and get it working. And now he's one of, he's like the main, main manufa manufacturer of them. So it, uh, it's a virtuous circle of, uh, of kind of cool people getting involved and helping out one another. But um, I, I'm on there all the time. <laughs> I'm on there all the time now. I think you're on there all the time. Uh, it's it's fun. We have we, we chat about fun stuff. We're starting to have some in-person meetups, which is cool. We had one hosted by Juan Clue in, uh, in Munich, which was fantastic. Um, and uh, we're gonna have another one at, definitely in um in nashville uh this summer that's that's uh that's where the magic happens so speaking speaking about this and speaking about the community let's dive a little bit to to another section of community driven things let's talk about potential partnerships collaborations or integrations that are pivotal for the growth of the bidx is there anything that is uh, in this space Yes. Yes. So much. Um, I've met so many people in the Bitcoin space as a result of this project, which has been really, really awesome. Like really passionate folks, really smart folks. Um, you know, for the BitX project specifically, these these partnerships with the manufacturers has, has been just, well, it's been pivotal um, because... I, I've only made a handful of them, right? I made those initial five and sent them out to people and I've made kind of like one or two of each revision since then. But like previous to our manufacturers, the only way to get a bid ax was to build it. And it's, you know, you can go look at Wantclue's uh, video library 
and uh, see what's involved in building them. It's not impossible, but it's also not easy. So the, the, uh, the manufacturers who have just showed up and decided they want to invest the time and resources in tooling up to make these, getting them out there and setting up online stores and taking payment and sent, mailing them out there, like that's huge because now we can get a lot of people getting their hands on these um, and trying it out and, you know, going in, being everywhere from just plugging it in and running an open source miner to tearing it down and changing it and hacking on it. So that's our most important um, partnership collaboration by far. Uh, there's been, you know, there's been um, other collaborations and uh, specifically integrations like Duncan made the BitHalo which is a, an add-on board that is beautiful. He gave me one. I've got it running over here. It's so cool. It just flashes gold uh, whenever a share is found. And it, it just adds this like this aesthetic touch and the kind of this personal touch to it. Because it's like just last night, I was like turned off the lights in my office and was going downstairs and and like it just flashed like, you know, in the dark gold and like lit up the room as I was walking down. I was like, that's really cool. It has this personal <laughs> touch to it. That's really neat. So that that's just like that was just Duncan's idea. He just wanted to do it, and we didn't really have any set interface for him to integrate with before this. Um, so that project inspired the BitAct Accessory Report, which is an like a set interface for people to integrate hardware with the BitAxes and. Hopefully we have more integrations like that, but uh, I think I think that's really cool. Actually, there, I know there's going to be some other uh, integrations. Speaking about this, and especially like add-ons that are added actually to this board, do you have anything like oh, from from the upcoming features perspective or updates that you would like to share with the community? Um. Well. Well, we um, we have been working on the idea of a much more dynamic display uh, for for the BitAx, uh, probably a color LCD display. Um, uh, Bitmaker, the nerd miner guy, has is obviously mastery of working with these graphic LCD displays, and has made a really cool interface. And we want to do a new one for the uh, the BitAx Hex. So I think there's going to be some some display uh, updates coming that will make this uh, cooler uh, looking and hopefully be a little easier to set up uh, with uh, some buttons to just make seeing the statistics that you're interested in of your Bitcoin miner. Um, I think that's I think that's pretty exciting. Um, looking forward to having that. Of course, the um, the the hex. Um, well, I guess I should take a step back. The uh, you can go get a um, the latest BitAx, the BitAx Super that uses the chip, the thirteen ninety eighty six, no, thirteen sixty eight, thirteen sixty eight. Yes, yeah. Good. I'm glad you. Okay, <laughs> it's trying to get away from me. the 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 thirteen sixty eight, the chip from the S twenty one, is in the BitAx uh, Supra, and um, that design is going to be released any day now. Ben has, has verified uh, 401. And so look for that hardware and firmware to be released on GitHub basically any day now. But you can go and buy them right now on Altair.com. I think um, Decentral is going to start selling them uh, very soon here if they aren't already. I know they're taking pre-orders, so I think those will probably be shipping pretty soon. That's an exciting thing to look forward to. That's a, that's a neat new chip this is like brand new we basically got that thing working like right after the s21 started shipping that was so fun um it, in fact it's so new that you can't get those chips uh <laughs> ben is buying brand new s21s and just taking a hot air gun to it and taking off all the chips to build these things it's so cool i know and uh um jonathan at uh decentral is doing the same thing um, I mean, it, you need you need to work around if you can't get those chips, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's I mean, the open you can get the part. chips. It's just there. There's a 
308 of them and they're all soldered inside of a miner. Uh, so that's exciting. The BitX Super, the BitX Hex is coming. Um, new displays are coming out. Um, we have some, maybe this isn't super exciting, but I, I'm interested. There's some uh, bug fixes coming, some longstanding bug fixes, some stability uh, in the firmware is coming. Um, there's a couple, uh, there's a bunch of things in the pipeline that I don't want to talk about just yet, but uh, rest assured we have a, a full pipeline of of totally cool stuff um, coming out and, uh, you know, not slowing down at all and accelerating, in fact. Um, like I said, a, a lot of things in service of this, the goal for the, for BitAx that I, that I stated, which is making a million, making an exa hash worth of miners. So, um, I mean, that would be so super cool. <laughs> yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. I believe so. I believe so. Definitely. But yeah. let's take a, let's take a vague look into the future. Um, what, well, what is your view of BitX in the next few years? Um, I, I want, so, you know, when I, when we started this, there was no open source Bitcoin mining hardware. Um, there was the brains open source, uh, brains OS, their open source firmware, but they canceled that. So there was no open source firmware, no open source hardware, a lot of open source software. Um, in fact, last fall I went to uh, TabConf, which is a Bitcoin, uh, developer conference and there was no mining there. There was just none. It was all, um, wallets and, um, nodes and mm -hmm. lightning and stuff, which is obviously all very cool, but there was no mining. Like people, I, I feel like I, people would be like, what are you working on? I'm like, oh, I'm working on Bitcoin mining. And they're like, are you lost? Like, what are you doing at this convention? And it was so weird. Cause it's like, this is a Bitcoin developer conference. Turns out Bitcoin mining is pretty important, but I think those two communities had just totally diverged because Bitcoin miners are these crazy dudes over here. They're proprietary ASICs and they don't talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. um, about it. And then all the rest of Bitcoin is this very cool, like developer culture, right? Bitcoin core and lightning and all that stuff is all open source. <coughs> so I would like to see the BitX project <coughs> popularize and bring open source back to mining and it's, it's happening, but, uh, that's kind of how I see, I, I want to see this ecosystem grow. Um, it's really important. Um, I hope that the success of the BitX, of which it's been very successful so far, I'm proud to report. Um, it, I don't know, like lights a fire under these other manufacturers' ass to like do some stuff open source. Um, see that like it can be done. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a vow of poverty. Like, you know, we're just getting started, but it's, there's people who are being financially successful on this. Um, so, uh, I, I would like to see it um, as a strong proof of concept for open source Bitcoin mining um, going forward. And then, of course, what I mentioned about, you know, we're going to get, we're going to like enable, unlock a ton, a ton of, of hash rate in homes. That's the major goal. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. And you know what? I think we might just do solar Bitcoin mining too, after all. Um, Turns out a bunch of other people on the OSMU are interested in solar um, Bitcoin mining. In fact, we're putting together a contest for the summer uh, with cash prizes to develop a solar Bitcoin miner. So, um, and it's a so bunch cool. of people are, are off and running on it already. So it's cool. Like we've got a like a a sponsor that's interested in like putting up the the money for this. So it's I think. So cool. This is that's kind of a, a an OSMU uh, thing. That's they're pretty OSMU and VidX are pretty pretty closely related, but slightly different. But um, I like to see OSMU and VidX sort of expand that outreach and, and encourage people to play with this in whatever way that they can and want to. All right, I think that that was. 
pretty nice to talking to you today. But before we actually wrap up anything, are there any final thoughts that you would like to share or at least tell us where can people go and learn more about BitX? BitX.org is my website uh, for the BitX. And on there, I've got a bunch of links to sort of the OSMU Discord, uh, my Twitter. I'm, I'm on Twitter way too much. I post tons of stuff on there. Um, all the GitHub stuff that, of course, has all the source code and design documents. Um, really, if you're even remotely interested in this, you should join the Discord and just start talking to people. There's all sorts of cool people on there who will just talk with you at length about whatever little facet of this you want to talk about. Uh, Twitter's cool too. Um, I'm trying to get more into into Noster. Uh, I think, you know, Noster is the decentralized social network that we need. So um, trying to get more over there. But yeah, bidx.org. It's just it's a very simple web page, but it has um, I think it has the key links, and I'll try to keep that updated with the stuff that uh, that's really important. There's a link to the um, to the OSMU wiki on there, where you can find an ever evolving uh, source of how tos, and then of course pay attention to uh, Want Clue's YouTube channel because I hear they're doing a sweet series on the Bitax. It's a perfect wrap up, wrap up for this one because I I thank you for, really for being here on the first episode of this series, for actually being here and telling us a little bit about the story of the BitX, telling us what drove you to actually invent it or instigate it. And now we're sitting here having this really huge community with lovely members coming up with new ideas. And I can't wait to see us in five years from now. Oh my gosh. Can you imagine five years from now? Like what? It's been like, I feel like <laughs> it's been like 10 months and we've, we've done like five years worth of work. It's going to be nuts. All right. Definitely. Thanks right. for having me. This has been great. I, th I think that's it for today. Uh, I don't want to go over one hour. We already did. So let's see. All right. I thank everybody for joining in here. Uh, thank you guys for listening to this or viewing to this. And I hope you will love this series and especially every single episode. So thanks for being here and see you next time. Bye-bye.